The event everyone's been waiting for at Heavenly Dragon Academy, the Beast Instructors Conference, is finally underway. As instructors from all over the place proudly display their exhibits, it quickly becomes apparent just how harsh the judging of the reviewing officials is. Hell, one guy gets given flat ones and twos out of ten for being unoriginal. Like the announcer lady saying, there's no room for lazy ass slackers out here. With the event going at full sail, the announcer woman calls out the beginning of a triennial event all Beast Instructors eagerly anticipate. The Beast Instructor Conference officially begins now. Before any further announcements, she declares the people's gratitude to the 5th Rank Academy of Holy Light City, Heavenly Dragon Academy, for hosting the conference on their grounds. The Academy's principal declares that the honor is all theirs, and he hopes everyone can thrive through this event. Seated next to him, Vice Principal Bai comments on the three-judge system that's been continued from previous conferences and reminds everyone that exceptional instructors will qualify for membership and association cultivation as well. Just as he intended, this has the crowd more fired up than ever since all the previous instructors to achieve these qualifications went on to become ninth tier beast instructors. In one particular area, a group of men are guided to their heavenly character seats. These are the instructors hoping to recruit any promising individuals who appear at the conference as their own apprentices. As these men speak amongst each other, one of them mentions that Ding not being here this year means less competition for them to grab up the talented instructors. Damn, these dudes have no loyalty. Makes sense though. Ding sucked balls. From off to the side of the line of throne-like seats they're sat in, the recruiters are all surprised and confused to see none other than Su Ping walking up to the final seat and taking it for himself. Dressed the way he is and with his clearly aloof attitude, the others all wonder who the hell this guy is and if he's been invited by the association or something. To the side, instructor Shi, who has long since learned not to underestimate Su Ping, simply smirks at their reactions. Back to the conference itself, instructor after instructor is given pathetic scores by the reviewing judges for failing to bring any innovation to their work, causing them to even lose their existing investors. It's all that the instructors off the side can manage to stall their own judgment when the reviewers turn their way, terrified of how they'll be rated. In the midst of this sea of fear, a lone voice suddenly calls out and actually invites the reviewers on their own. This voice belongs to none other than Zhang, who has a resolute expression on her face. Though everyone's surprised by her boldness, they can't help but commend her courage. Zhang leads the judges to her own exhibit on the more rundown side of the hall, leading those in the crowd watching her to think she's some overconfident nobody. Yeah, keep that same energy in a few minutes, fools. Even the judges grow suspicious and ask if she's trying to gain their sympathy. Zhang is quick to assure them she has no such intentions, though, and asks them to just watch. With her friend, ZF's assistance, she brings out a single vial of a bright purple liquid. Right before their eyes, she feeds the whole contents of the vial to a fourth-tier young dragon beast, with no prior training. After feeding it the liquid, Zhang and ZF both pull on gloves and activate a technique known as dragon blood forging causing purple sparks of lightning to arc off of the young dragon. As the judges and crowd alike watch in shock and awe, a massive spectral dragon rises from the body of the young beast and releases a massively oppressive force, causing all in range to feel affected. The spectral dragon is so enormous that even Vice Principal Bai notices it from his throne, and his eyes go wide in shock as he recognizes it. That is the purple blood heavenly dragon which went extinct over 9,000 years ago. Vegeta would have a conniption here. As the massive purple apparition slowly fades away, the judges watch on with widened eyes, unable to comprehend what just happened. Uni announcers left to ask just what they've seen right now. Meanwhile, Zhang and ZF are completely oblivious to everyone else's reactions as they examine the results of their little demonstration. Between the two of them, the formerly fourth-tier young dragon is now a majestic purple dragon with beautiful feathered wings. The only people more oblivious at that moment than Zhang and her friend are the other academy students in the crowd. The fools are so overtaken with jealousy and insecurity that they convince themselves Zhang's technique was all bark and no bite, having failed to upgrade her beast. They comment on how the judges will be sure to give her a low score and embarrass her in front of this massive crowd, completely ignoring the fact that the judges themselves are clearly amazed, literally plotting on her downfall. Hoofy off fools. Almost as if to purposely shut those idiots up, all the heavenly characters here to recruit talented instructors rush over in a stampede yelling to let them see the person who just performed that cultivation technique. As a lot of them argue over who has first dibs on this person, Zhang is put up on the big screen, and the announcer lady explains to the crowd 
that all the heavenly instructors are showing an interest in this one single person. Before long, the heavenly instructors recognize her as a student of class 8, and they all start jumping to conclusions, such as that Ding has been keeping her hidden from the public. Man screwed Ding. All my homies hate that moron. The second they've identified Zhang, the instructors scramble to find info on her, and start making outrageous perks and boons in exchange for accepting their recruitment offers. Unfortunately for them, two even bigger fish have decided to descend into this hunting ground of a pond. Two trails of light zoom past the crowd, as none other than the principal and VP buy land on sight, and start bickering over which of them has first dibs. You'd think they're a tenth of their actual age, from the way they're acting. As the geezers continue to exchange barbed words, the principal suddenly uses the ninth tier power of teleportation. To get to Zhang first, Bai isn't one to be left behind though, and he uses the Ninth tier technique, known as spatial contraction, to do the same. Both old men arrive at Zhang's exhibit at the exact same time, scaring off everyone else in the area and leaving each other as their only competitors for her apprenticeship. Upon VP Bai's request to have a closer look at the dragon, Zhang just trained. The girl happily invites him closer, while her friend trembles in awe of the man. Meanwhile, in the background, a crowd is blown away by just how much special treatment Zhang is getting for her impressive feats. Stepping closer to the specimen, VP Bai comments on how the Purple Blood Heavenly Dragon is said to be the ancestor of all other dragons. Based on all the features and attributes of this little beast here, he's confident in saying that this beast has indeed integrated the bloodline of that precise heavenly dragon. VP Bai goes on to mention how this training method of hers can greatly benefit those facing a block while the principal brags about his academy students. What follows from that point on is a vicious verbal dogfight between the VP and principal over who will be the one to recruit Zhang. While the two old men offer benefit after benefit, the audience is stunned by what they're seeing, and some of Zhang's former bullies regret not forging a better relationship with her. Hindsight to be in it losers. To the surprise of both men vying for her favor, Zhang addresses them with a resolute expression quite quickly. All over the venue, everyone watching waits with bated breath to see who she's going to choose, still seated on the throne he sat on a while ago now. Su Ping smiles at the success of the young lady he always knew had this potential within her. With his work done here, he gets up and prepares to head back to his store for the day. That's when Zhang makes a statement that freezes every single person in attendance in their tracks. She's choosing to turn down both the VP and the principal in favor of devoting her life to boss Shu Kuang. All right, Su Ping's going by that right now. I forgot about that honestly. Su Ping himself is perhaps the most shocked of all, stopping in place with a deadpan expression. All over the place, chaos erupts as people scramble to find info on just who the hell the Shu Kuan person is. Seeing the state of the conference in the wake of Zhang's decision, Su Ping hesitantly decides to reveal himself, maintaining the same deadpan expression. Bro does not want to be here. To his credit, VP Bai humbly backs off the moment he realizes Su Ping is in the picture. At the same time, the principal is stumped as to what would make Zhang choose this man over him. Zhang proudly states that Boss Xu has helped her on multiple difficult occasions, donating research materials and funds for her to reach this point in the first place. All over the place, people are stunned to hear that this Xu Kuan fellow is responsible for procuring extinct items, like the ones used to bring out the Purple Blood Heavenly Dragon. Meanwhile, Su Ping pays absolutely zero heed to the masses and tells Zhang he's leaving this place soon before asking if she's still determined to follow him. Her gaze steeled, John tells him that she's willing to go anywhere, as long as it's at his side. Damn homegirl, I was not familiar with your game. Right after she says this, the academy's principal finally bursts with indignation, and refuses to let her be taken away by anyone. While touting all the resources he can grant her, rather than souping, John is the one to address him and remind him of his own phrase about how traveling a thousand miles is better than reading a thousand books. Don't look at me, I don't get these proverbs either. She goes on to remind the principal that their city may be known as the breeding sanctuary, but there are so many training methods and techniques not taught here. Boss Xu's deaf training method is just one such example. While the crowd tries to work out what the hell a deaf training method is, someone questions the possibility of Xu being a fraud. Seeing the potential in this argument, the principal latches on and declares that Xu Kuan may only take away Zhang if he can defeat the older man in a battle. To Su Ping's unsurprised annoyance, Instructor Shi and Old Bai both stay back, letting things play out rather than vouching for him. Realizing that this is the only real way out of here, Su Ping tells the principal he has just one more condition for their battle, 
As he descends to the principal's level via levitation, Su Ping explains that he wants it to be broadcast throughout the city. Oh, he knows he's winning this. A victim of his own hubris even more than Su Ping, the principal smugly declares that he can't wait to show the whole city his defeat. Meanwhile, the public is beginning to recognize Su Ping, as more and more people feel him to be familiar. Once both challengers are in the arena of the principal's choosing, a cage full of beasts is brought out for them to choose their beasts for the battle. With the ferocious beings clawing at their prison, the crowd worries that this whole thing is going a bit too far. As usual, however, Su Ping demonstrates just how differently he's built, as he rejects the principal's offer of mercy, walks up to the cage, and unleashes his aura to such extraordinary effect that the monsters are instantly subdued, seeing one in particular that catches his eye. Su Ping tells an ironclad Iceland's beast to rise. Not a single person fails to notice how incredible it is that he's tame a beast without even lifting a finger, gaining VP buys praise as well. Back on the field though, the principal has his own show of power to put on. With a single upraised hand, he tames a blazing fire spirit dragon, shutting everyone up. Meanwhile, VP Bai picks up on something said by the announcer and offers everyone a lesson on magic affinities. He explains that if trained properly, this beast can completely bypass its elemental disadvantage and overpower the Iceland's beast. I guess hitting stuff harder really is the answer to everything. As the beast training stage of the battle ticks onwards, the principal brings out a small bag of some substance and tosses it into the air, causing the appearance of what are known as centennial dragon bones. With these and the principal's refinement technique, a massive blue specter rises into the sky, emanating from none other than the blazing fire spirit dragon. While the principal's side of the arena is engulfed in an oppressive aura, and all are left fearful. Su Ping is just feeding his beast, and not even anything special, just a bunch of Buddha's heart grass. As noted by the announcer, she's just in the middle of proposing theories as to what he's doing. When Su Ping decides that the beast is ready for the next step, Without any warning whatsoever, Su Ping rises, brings up his arm, and yells out for the Thunder Path to engrave. And just like that, the heavens above answer his call, sending down wild and powerful arcs of lightning. While the announcer remains in confused awe, VP Bai recognizes this technique with a horrified expression on his face. Could this be? Holy Spirit Capital? As Su Ping finishes his incantation, a bolt of lightning engulfs the Iceland's beast, getting absorbed into it and leaving its eyes shining with power. With his beast training stage complete, Su Ping looks up with a cool grin, waiting for the battle to commence. On the other side of the arena, Blazing Fire Spirit Dragon is moments away from going berserk. It's time for the battle to begin. Among the observing audience, many viewers needly conclude that Su Ping's ironclad Iceland's beast must not have evolved properly, since it lacks any visual changes. VP Bai is one of the few who see through this ruse though, and knows for a fact that Lightning Su Ping called down was special. Only one with the qualifications of a Holy Spirit Beast Instructor could possibly access an elemental origin, as he suspects Su Ping has done. With but a few more words from the announcer, Blazing Firestorm unleashes a torrent of flames which are dodged by the Iceland's beast like death itself. The dodge seems to have been anticipated though, as the Blazing Firestorm goes on to create a ring of flames all around the arena, hoping for the Iceland's beast to slowly be cooked alive, which would probably taste awesome, to be fair. The announcer mentions as much as she explains that the temperature on the field is already as high as 600 degrees, and as though being stuck in a live oven wasn't already bad enough, the Iceland's beast then has to deal with the principal's blazing fire spirit, slashing down with several inferno slashes. When the intense waves of burning energy impact the Iceland's beast head-on, the announcer calls out in surprise, wondering if it's already over. The watching audience cries out in shock and awe as well, amazed by the principal's prowess. However, Right as the old man in question is basking in the praise and acting smug, Zhang nervously tells him the match isn't quite over yet. Sure enough, the Iceland's beast that was caught inside the flames suddenly disperses, revealing itself to have been nothing more than an illusion. The blazing fire spirit shares in its master's confusion as his head swivels around trying to spot its opponent. Despite its efforts though, the Iceland's beast remains unseen by all, causing immense confusion. Did bro just peace out of the whole place? Amidst the confusion, Su Ping lets out an amused grin, and just says that here it is. A moment after his words, a powerful gust of wind blows across the arena, coming in with such force that it causes all the fires surrounding it to go out at once. At this point, the principal is no longer amused and activates his own Ninith-tier visual enhancement in an attempt to spot the hidden Iceland's beast. 
However, what he sees is far from anything he ever could have expected. Over in the viewing box, VP Bai advises the puzzled announcer to have the broadcast switch to a high-speed camera to understand what's happening. Before long, the order has gone through the appropriate channels, and the broadcast camera has been changed. What is now visible to the public's untrained eyes is something they can hardly fathom. The Iceland's beast isn't gone from the arena at all. In fact, it's moving at such intensely high speeds that it can only ever be traced on a camera, recording a million frames per second. Is that even a real thing? How is that even a real thing? Even that isn't quite enough though, and the camera has to be changed again, this time to one that's outputting 10 million frames per second. With this new view, the Iceland's beast's path is finally capable of being seen by the audience to some extent. Despite their difficulty in seeing the beast, none seated around the arena can dispute that the creature is definitely there, as the wind pressure generated by its high-speed movement alone is pushing them out of their seats. In the arena itself, this high-speed movement is utilized to utterly crush the blazing fire spirit as the Iceland's beast catapults itself through the dragon's wings, tearing him to shreds. That's Mortal Kombat tier brutality right there. As the principal feels himself being taken to the edge, Paws, Su Ping snaps his fingers and asks if he would like to keep going. In sync with his snap, the Iceland's beast finally stops long enough to be seen properly, its claws held at the dragon's throat like an executioner's blade. Seeing just how vast the gap is between their beasts, the principal suddenly has the fight sup right out of him and falls to his knees in despair. He gives up. The entire conference is frozen in silence. At the shocking turn of events, as the announcer declares the winner of the battle to be Shu Kuang. However, her announcement is interrupted by none other than VP Bai, who decides the charade has gone on long enough, raising his voice so all can hear him. He declares that this man's name is not Shu Kuang. He hails from Long Jiang City and his true name is Su Ping. Yeesh! Way to blow the whistle and gramps. As expected, everyone soon begins to recognize Su Ping from the famous legendary tier who took on the Story Skies organization all on his own. Between that and the beyond exceptional results his store is well recognized for, the audience is quick to accept and acknowledge that the principal never stood a chance against him. From where they're watching, Zhang, Zef, and Senior are all in awe of Su Ping's true identity and what a big shot he is, though they already had their suspicions. Meanwhile, Su Ping's focus is not on any of the attention being funneled his way, but on the system window showing that he has achieved his latest mandatory task. As he receives the reward provided for doing so, the principal kneels before Su Ping and starts brown-nosing him before asking if he could know more about the training technique he used. Any more transparent, and he'd be an actual slime ball. Surprisingly enough, it's the announcer who addresses the principal and tells him he's being too forward, since secret techniques are a highly private matter. Only half a moment later, though, that notion goes right out the window as Su Ping openly shares the name of the technique, Lightning Path Mark. He tells the principal he hasn't perfected the technique, so he can't teach it to others just yet. When the principal comments on how groundbreaking this technique would be if popularized, Su Ping admits that he has every intention of documenting it for others, once he has a better understanding of it. Instantly, everyone in the area breaks into shock conversation. Over the fact that he'd be willing to share something so valuable, and some people already put up offers to buy it, in response to these offers, Su Ping simply states that he has no plans to sell the technique. Rather, he's going to post it online for free. And that's not for them, but for all those of lower social status, so they can have an equal opportunity to better their own lives. Bro's gonna make me cry with how wholesome that is. Back in their area, Senior and his men are weeping with joy at their boss's generosity, while ZF congratulates Zhang on getting such a great master. They're glazing like all hell, but I can't blame him. Before she moves to join Su Ping and leave the place, VP Bai comes up to Zhang with a tray holding a teapot and tells her to perform the traditional master-disciple ritual with Su Ping. Even though the girl is more than happy to do exactly that, Su Ping, who is watching from the side, is of different opinions. He takes the teapot from VP Bai before Zhang can grab it and tells them there's no need for such formalities. As far as he's concerned, Zhang has already proven her determination. Besides, he has hands of his own, so why should he make her serve him? VP Bai insists that this is tradition and rules should not be broken, but Su Ping cheekily holds the teacup in his teeth and says that his rule is to not be stuck in old ways. You tell him King. Then Su Ping offers his hand to Zhang and tells her that all he demands is that she put her all into becoming the best at what she does. With the two ready to leave, Su Ping raises one final matter to discuss with VP Bai. 
Without the slightest hint of shame, he tells Bai that the theses he's required to write are pretty much guaranteed with Zhang's help and his inevitable decoding of the lightning path. But of course, the old man realizes instantly what Su Ping is hinting at and frustratedly tells the young man he can't learn the awakening technique until he has the actual thesis completed. All of a sudden, while Su Ping is lamenting the old man's stubbornness, a robed individual approaches with a report for VC Bai and tells him his dispatch pioneer investigation team has returned. Thankfully, the team has faced no casualties despite losing contact with the base, which is a massive relief to Bai. Turning to Su Ping, he tells the young man to attend to Meg's report meeting to discuss the anomalies in the wastelands and how to deal with them. Meg falls before long and with it, the meeting in the Beast Instructors Association headquarters begins. It's here that the Pioneer Investigation Team's leader, Li Yu Gong Chao, reports his findings. Namely, there has been no sign of the Four Kings whatsoever in relation to the recent anomalies. Without delay, he brings out a glowing blue rock and tells them this is the cause of the anomalies, seeing their confusion. He chucks the thing over for his beast to consume, resulting in the creature, suddenly mutating to a full grade higher in just a few seconds. Everyone present is in utter shock, since that kind of growth normally takes multiple years. The Yu Gong Chao addresses the higher ups and explains that a new starry sky rift has appeared in the wasteland, leading directly to a world rich in these energy crystals. This is what has been attracting so many formidable beasts in seemingly random directions. Just when you think the officials would come together to protect their people, Human Greed wins out, and the higher-ups declare their priority is establishing a base near the rift so they can loot the crystals. Li Yugong Chao does not refute this, but tells them he needs some high-powered elites to help eradicate the beasts in the area. Upon hearing this, one of the men in attendance is quick to point toward what he calls the perfect candidate. None other than the man himself, Su Ping. Taking a good look at Su Ping, Li Yugong Chao questions if someone so young can really handle a mission like this. Rather than addressing his concerns, Su Ping takes charge and states that they should have this mineral crystal tested, along with any beasts that have consumed it, to ensure there are no harmful side effects. Upon hearing this, Gong Chao grows defensive and harshly tells him that they've already been using these crystals for weeks with no ill effects. Rather than fire back with hostility, Su Ping tries to be understanding and tells Gong Chao that he trusts the man, but a few weeks isn't quite enough to rule out toxicity. Over from where he's seated, VP Bai speaks up as well, seconding Su Ping's words, W assist Gramps. Seeing that there's no winning this particular argument, Gong Chao hands over all the recovered crystals for testing. And then he turns to Bai and asks, since when they started letting the youth dictate their actions. With one eye open, Bai looks at Gong Chao and spouts off a proverb about rivers and the younger generation meaning chances to excel. Unrelated, but am I the only one who thinks that Baird looks fake as hell? A solid five hours go by before the results of the testing on the crystals are finally in. After dozens of tests, these energy crystals have been determined to be completely harmless with nearly zero side effects. The hell do you mean merely? Gong Chao exasperatedly turns to the others and asks them if they see how pointless this was. After all, how could one who's been clearing the wilderness for decades like himself be wrong on this? With no response to that, the attendees of the meeting are quick to start brown-nosing Gong Chao and lightheartedly berating Su Ping for questioning a senior expert. Even though he's being talked down to, Su Ping maintains a blank expression and asks Gong Chao what the world beyond the rift looks like. To everyone's surprise, Gong Chao reveals they've been unable to retrieve any data since an electromagnetic field on the other side messes up all their electronics. With his hands clasped before his face, Su Ping states that they basically know nothing then. Internally, however, he's eager to even get a glimpse of this realm so he can scavenge it with the system's nurturing plane. Without delay, he decides the risk is worth it and volunteers to join the mission to deal with the beasts in the area of the rift, seeing as how he's been away for a while. Gong Chao is unaware of Su Ping's status and starts snickering at the young man's declaration, believing him to be an inexperienced and overconfident child. However, when he asks if Yipi Bai to assign 15 ninth tier tamers to the mission, he's given a reality check from the old man himself. Bai tells Gong Chao that Su Ping is in fact a newly risen legendary beast tamer. This alone causes Gong Chao to rethink every single opinion he's formulated of Su Ping in this short time, as he realizes why the boy is being shown such respect. He instantly apologizes to Su Ping and states that just three more titled beast tamers will be enough if he's on their side. BUP Bai, pleased with this resolution, orders for the team to be ready by tonight and for everyone involved to prep their gear. 
so they can leave at dawn. The next morning, Su Ping, Gong Chao, and two other beast tamers fly over a forest of crimson trees on the approach to the rift. These two are the ninth tier tamers, Silver Owl and Cold Wolf. New to the situation, they ask Gong Chao why they're taking such a frontal approach, to which he tells them the rift is hidden inside a cave. That being the case, it's best for them to avoid anything that could cause them to lose their way. Although his reasoning seems sound, Su Ping can't help but feel that Gong Chao is hiding something important from them. Right as he has this thought, a laser strikes their chopper, forcing the tamers to abandon it and fly down to find their attacker. To their shock and my horror, the monsters that have attacked them appear to be something straight out of the lowest circle of hell itself. These monsters shoot a massive network of lasers at the group, prompting Cold Wolf to put up a shield, while Silver Owl provides cover fire. The warning flies forward with a quick application of her skill, Eagle Claw Hundredfold Slash, shredding everything in its path, or at least, that was the plan. The monsters show an unprecedented level of intelligence, as they use the strange and hard trees in the area to block her attack, leaving them unscathed. Before the two of them even know what's happening, some of these vile creatures suddenly manage to attack from their rear, spelling their doom. Right at that moment though, Su Ping rushes into the fray and moves to activate his divine demonic fist. Unfortunately, he too is trapped and ensnared in the limbs of these beasts before he can use his power. To his surprise, Silver Owl calls out to Su Ping to prioritize his own safety, even as she struggles to escape her own captured state. Meanwhile, Gong Chao and Cold Wolf are struggling to fight off their own group of monsters. Suddenly, Gong Chao calls out to the others to each deal with their individual monsters and regroup away from here afterward. While Silver Owl and Cold Wolf are ecstatic at the opportunity to cut loose and fight with their pets, Su Ping tries to advise against splitting up since they don't know what they're up against. Unfortunately, his pleas fall on deaf ears as the two trainers are determined to prove themselves, egged on by Gong Chao's words. Su Ping simply hopes they're right about their own skills, before calling out the big guns himself. With Skelly at his side, it's time to end this. The wave of malevolent power that comes with Skelly's summoning washes over the area like a blanket of despair, and a single slash at his blade decapitates dozens of the monsters below. In an increasingly horrific twist of events though, new heads sprout from the necks of these beheaded beasts in mere moments, screaming with pain. Deciding to take a different approach, Su Ping uses his divine demonic fist avatar to crush a bunch of the monsters between its spectral palms, turning them into shattered husks. Then, as they fall to the ground below, he brings the avatar's fists down in a move named Dual Dragons, Demon Quelling. In the aftermath of Su Ping's onslaught, the shattered and vaporized monsters still persist and try to regenerate, leaving him to wonder just what the hell makes them so resilient. That's when one of them finally sizzles away into nothingness right in front of him, leaving only a single horn of some sort where its body was. Stu Ping's confusion only increases as he wonders why they would carry such things inside themselves. Hey man, you don't need a reason to be horny. I'll show myself out. All of a sudden, he hears an anguished scream from off in the distance. Recognizing the voice as Cold Wolf's, Su Ping dashes towards it in a blind panic. The second he arrives at the location where the scream came from, Su Ping's eyes widen with rage at what he sees. More furious than he's been in a long time, he unleashes a blast of power so immense that it wipes out everything in sight for miles. Everything, that is, except one particular monster that manages to block it. As it unleashes a return blast from the jaw on its stomach, Su Ping defends himself with the shields of his own beasts. Right now, his main concern is that the beast before him not only blocked one of his stronger attacks, it also seemed to let out a human-like laugh as it did it. As Skelly and the Great Flame Dragon hold the creature in place, Umbrageddon unleashes a dragon art to finish it. However, instead of being beaten, the monster breaks free and stares Su Ping right in the eye, before saying one word with a smirk. Scared? In that singular moment of shock from Su Ping, the monster takes advantage of the pause, and attacks his beasts with renewed viciousness. As his partners hold off the beast, Stu Ping brings out a trio of glowing rings and stares at them. It seems he'll have to bring that person back to figure out what's going on here. The items in Stu Ping's hand right now are none other than the intermediate and advanced beast capture rings he obtained from the system shop in bulk not long ago. Because you can never have too many master balls. Or would these be ultra balls? As he holds them in his palm, Stu Ping looks at the monster and thinks, that capturing this red-skinned baboon will cost him some decent energy. Hold. On. That had to be racially motivated, what the hell? 
The energy investment will be well worth it though, as Su Ping is sure he can make it submit, if he can just capture it and get it back to his shop. Right on cue, a veritable army of the lesser monsters springs out from the woodwork to stop Su Ping from moving on their leader. Having run out of patience for these buffoons, Su Ping simply swipes the arm of his avatar like a fly swatter and eviscerates every single one of them. With that taken care of and the lead monster held in place by his beasts, Su Ping chucks a handful of the capture rings at it with all his strength. Unfortunately for the good guys though, the demon dude manages to break free and swipe a fist at the rings at the last moment, shattering every last one of them. With the final obstacle overcome, the demon smirks towards Su Ping and lets out a grunt of amusement. The man in question, on the other hand, is already activating his backup plan. With a tap of his finger on his wristband, coordinates are fed to the satellite in orbit, which became his not long ago. A mere few seconds later, a ring of fire descends from the heavens above, parting the dark clouds over their battlefield. Even the demon finds its attention drawn toward this light, but too little too late. In the middle of turning his head, the monster is struck with a pillar of exploding light and energy, shot down straight from space. Despite all of this, even now, the demon persists and emerges from the explosion, with nothing more than some fire on his body to show for it. Unfortunately for him, the onslaught is not over just yet. Skelly comes flying in, forcing the demon to block his blade with both palms. While he's distracted, Umbrageddon and Dark Flame Dragon come together to hit him with a pair of vicious kidney crackers. Despite all that it has suffered, the demon still refuses to go down. At this point, I just have to respect it. As it tries to engage the dragons in a melee, however, the orbital blast crashes down on him once more. This time, the demon is prepared and manages to spot the hidden attack within the attack. He sees that more of the capture rings have been thrown and swings out an arm to crush them. This time, however, he misses by just enough for the rings to fly past and impact the beast's open palm. Little by little, they dissolve into the wind itself. Liu and the beast confused and in a life-or-death battle with Skelly, except it's less of a battle and more Skelly shooting forth a bar edge of capture rings in place of arrows from his bow. One after another, more and more rings impact and evaporate after being unsuccessful, until finally, it happens. When the capture rings finally succeeds, and the beast is pulled into a hell all its own, as it's sucked and pulled into a pocket dimension, by chains emerging from its own body, with the lead demon beaten, the rest of them flee with their tails between their legs. Meanwhile, Su Ping is left behind to mourn the loss of those he couldn't protect, hanging onto their protective vests like a memento. However, much to Su Ping's surprise, Gong Chao pulls up with Silver Owl's hurt body slung over his shoulder. And most curious of all, the protective vest that she has on is fully intact, even though Su Ping just saw her vest without her. Something's not right here, and can already sense as much. As Gong Chao asks Su Ping if he drove off all those demonic monsters, Su Ping discreetly gets a good look at the armor worn by Silver Owl. Then, without letting any of the others see, he distracts Gong Chao with words about the monster horde while simultaneously storing away the destroyed armor vests that belonged to Silver Owl and Cold Wolf. If things weren't already suspicious enough, Gong Chao's attitude is enough to make alarm bells go off in anyone's mind, with how open and animated he's being in his apologies. Really, since when is he such a punk? Even Silver Owl seems off, as she apologizes for holding them back and causing them to be down to three people, when they aren't even at the Starry Sky Rift yet. With the damaged armor vests finally being fully stored away, Su Ping turns on the two and puts forth his first test. He asks Silver Owl if she remembers what she said to Cold Wolf, right before their aircraft was attacked earlier. Though she takes a couple of moments to get it out, she manages to repeat her near-exact words from the moment and the context, causing Gong Chao to ask if Su Ping really cares about that stuff right now. Once again, uncharacteristic of his usual behavior, Gong Chao smiles at him apologetically and tells him they're all quite injured right now. Upon hearing this, Su Ping tells him they'll head back to the base city to plan their next steps, surprising Gong Chao. He turns back with a smile on his face and starts yapping about rallying support when suddenly, his feet are no longer on the ground. Su Ping has called out Blazikan and is having the dragon carry each of the two with a clawed arm. Standing atop his beast head with Skelly at his side, Su Ping cites the presence of dangerous monsters as the reason they're better off traveling like this. Pretty solid excuse. 10 out of 10 would fall for it. As he flies with the two squeezed tight in Blazikon's arms, 
Su Ping internally ponders the possible threat of more red-skinned demons, like the one he just narrowly defeated earlier. All he's certain of for now is that rushing things won't help him. Upon arriving back at the base city later on, Su Ping deposits his two passengers, who are in need of medical treatment. Before they can be taken away, though, Su Ping informs the men on site that these two are to be placed in separate wards and kept completely isolated under lock and key. Upon hearing his orders for them to be kept, totally quarantined, the UP Bai asks if he's putting them under house arrest. Even the agents on site question his decision, not wanting to treat someone so many years their senior like some dangerous criminal. Yeah, I've got a spoiler for you dudes and you won't like it. Even Gong Chao himself asks Su Ping if this is necessary, though Silver Owl seems much more accepting of the situation. When asked for proof of them being a danger, Su Ping tells them he has no solid evidence right now, but needs them to trust him in light of how formidable their current enemy is. Out of seemingly nowhere, VP Bai tells the others to proceed, as Su Ping is asked if only to see how this plays out. Later on, VP Bai and Su Ping speak in a more private room, where the former asks the latter to finally explain just what happened. Though he annoyedly tells the old man, he doesn't answer to him. Su Ping does bring out the damaged armor plates from before and shows them to Bai. Sure enough, the old man recognizes those as Silver Owl and Cold Wolf's armor, confirming Su Ping's suspicion. With a grimace on his face, he tells Bai that he witnessed the wearers of this armor sacrifice themselves with his own eyes. The one he's brought back in the physical form of Silver Owl is what he believes to be some kind of imposter. At that exact moment, a robed man suddenly bursts into the room and tells Bai that energy crystals have been discovered all over the lands. Now, all major base cities have sent out their own expedition teams to mine these deposits. Something is definitely not adding up here. Away from the struggles being faced by the young man who is our protagonist, completely oblivious to the events of his expedition, a beast tamer battle is taking place in Yakuza base city between two lions of similar levels. One of these, however, is clearly roided all the way out. The losing beast tamer confusedly asks what the hell is going on, when the two beasts were formerly on the same level. In response, a young man in strange armor brings out an energy crystal, showing it to the crowd and explaining its potential to boost any who consume it. Pretty much instantly, everyone on the scene clamors to buy the crystal from the man, eager for a shortcut to power. One of the people on the scene who hears about this crystal is a bright-eyed young man with hope for his future, and a young woman at his side. The second he hears someone call for teammates to mine this crystal with, he jumps at the chance to join in. The young lady with him is much more cautious and asks if he's really sure about this. Guess we know who has the brains between the two. In response, the young man just tells her that this is clearly the only real path for him, since he's been stuck at the same tier for years now. Has he tried push-ups, sit-ups, and plenty of juice though? Paying no heed to the girl's concerns, he moves to join the mining team, determined to make something of himself by any means. Unfortunately for the port chumps that decided to form this team, they find themselves blocked from moving forward at the registration area for rift expeditions. The two soldiers standing guard inform these young men and women that the forest they wish to enter is a restricted region that is forbidden until the authorities have properly investigated and deemed it safe for exploration. As you'd expect, this goes over about as well as a gallon of spoiled milk, especially considering they've seen pioneer teams coming back from exploring the forest. The soldiers reiterate that the place is forbidden, and even pioneer teams aren't allowed in anymore. To further drive home their point, the two release a portion of their astral power, all but driving the young ones to their knees as the pressure bears down upon them. With no other option left, the young men in the lead apologize for their offense and promise to leave at once. Yeah, why don't I believe that? A little distance away from the gate they've been forbidden from, the young men are angrily lamenting the loss of such a great opportunity when someone new comes onto the scene. An effeminate young man, at least I think he's a man, addresses them all and declares that the Beast Instructor Association has gone too far. He even claims that they're torturing a friend of his for the energy crystals he dug out from the rift. Massive cap, by the way, with how disgruntled these young ones already are, doesn't take much for the newcomer to convince them that the association is lying to them all and trying to hoard the rift for their own benefit. Just like that, he has cemented himself in their minds as some sort of messiah and convinces them to join him through a path out of the city and into the blood forest, so they can explore to their heart's content. As everyone else chants this supposed messiah's praise, the young man from before approaches him and expresses his gratitude before asking the man's name. Rather than giving them his real name, he simply tells them they can call him Anbai, because that's totally not a red flag, right? 
Meanwhile, Su Ping speaks to VP Bai via Holocall to discuss the current situation and their decision to restrict access to the Crimson Forest. They're not sure if the news of the crystal is being spread on purpose, but either way, they need to figure out the truth behind what happened in the rift and fast. On Bai's side, he's already having Li Yu, Gong Chao, and Silver Owl interrogated to that end. As for Su Ping, well, he has his own prisoner to interrogate. With that cryptic statement, he ends the call with Bai and summons forth none other than the demonic beast he captured back in the forest. All of a sudden, as soon as it's released, the demon attempts to attack Su Ping, only for the young man to completely hoe him with just one hand. He then proceeds to straight up rip the demon's arms off and demands to know what the energy crystals are and where they, the demons, have come from. Infuriated by this humiliation and Su Ping's condescending words, the demon regenerates its arms and openly moves to attack his captor once more. Dude's the definition of all brawn and no brains. Before the demon can so much as take one step, Su Ping leaps towards its head, grabs its skull, and teleports them to his main store back home. Suddenly finding himself standing amidst a massive crowd of humans, the demon smirks and prepares to consume them all. At least that's the plan until a golden spear comes out of nowhere and blows half his body to smithereens. Following the trail of the spear, Anna walks toward the demon and asks Su Ping if killing customers is really the best marketing strategy. Su Ping can only nervously smile at her and ask her not to kill the beast, since he sort of needs her to extract some memories from it. Now in a back storage room, Su Ping negotiates with Anna over the price for her usage of her memory extraction power. To put it simply, he's offering her two staff points for the work, but unfortunately for him, Anna's been reading up on the system's rules and knows she's not bound to follow his orders outside of work. With the system on her side, she tells Su Ping she has all the leverage and demands 20 points for this job. And anytime he comes for her help from now onwards, that number will continue to double. Sis is one mean businesswoman. With no other real option at his disposal, Su Ping is forced to accept this deal, and Anna gets to work. As the golden light coalesces in her hands, the demon realizes that this isn't good for him and attempts to run away. Unfortunately for him, there's not really anywhere to run, both literally and figuratively in this case. As Anna's power bores into the demon and she activates Mind Read, the effect of her actions is felt dozens of miles away. To be precise, the effect of her mind reading is felt by none other than Ambi, who is currently leading an army of humans to an unknown fate. While continuing to lead them, Ambi holds onto his head and smirks at the revelation that such a strong human exists on this plane. Without another thought, he clenches his fist and the result is instant. The demon in Su Ping's shop explodes in a shower of blood and gore, for seemingly no reason at all. Anna answers Su Ping's questioning words with an explanation as to how an outside force seemed to affect the monster and cause its explosion before she could get to any useful memories within its brain. Su Ping can only curse in disappointment as he's both lost his only lead as well as been tricked out of almost two dozen staff points. Seeing his frustration, Anna throws the old dog a bone and tells him She'll answer any other question within her knowledge. After thinking about her offer a little bit, Su Ping shows her a picture of the energy crystals that are gaining fame and tells her a bit about it. Once she has the gist of the matter, Su Ping asks her just what these minerals are and where they come from. Surprisingly enough, Anna scoffs at Su Ping's words and asks if he's playing dumb. When Su Ping only answers with more frustration and anger, Anna looks at him seriously and asks if he can't recognize the very stuff that he's eaten so much of back in her realm. The only thing that's different here is the raw material for the crystal. It's his own kind instead of hers. Wait, what? That's so gross. Sure enough, Su Ping quickly comes to the correct conclusion that the energy crystals are created using the lives of humans. And one look at what's happened to the humans following Ambi is more than enough to confirm this theory. Suddenly, Su Ping's wristband starts beeping, and he answers the holocall from VP Bai. To his surprise, the demon in his possession turns out to not be the only one who has been blown up. Both Gong Chao and Silver Owl have been removed from the picture in the exact same way. As they discuss these latest events, Su Ping reveals what he's learned about the energy crystals and their source. Before going any further, he shows VP Bai the strange spiky tissue left in place of the demon's corpse at his request. VP Bai goes on to ask Su Ping about the demons he killed in the Crimson Forest and goes silent upon hearing that they left behind similar tissue. Between all of them, VP Bai now feels confident in identifying the culprit behind their recent misfortune. It is none other than one of the four kings. The one name is the legendary Transcendence Voy himself. Well damn, how about that? 
Everyone present in the control room VP Bai is calling from who is absolutely stuck, still in shock at what they've just heard. One of them insists it can't be one of the four kings, since they're locked away deep within the abyss. A curious Suping asks what this abyss is to be able to trap the four kings themselves. In response to his question, one particular soldier speaks up and explains that the abyss is actually a man-made hole in the far north with a depth of 8,000 meters. At the bottom of that abyss is a space rift that leads to a whole other planet, which is what they refer to when they speak of the abyss. Suping is surprised by the sheer scope of the Four Kings' prison and realizes that they called it man-made. When he asked about this, the soldier explains that the rift is under a sea, known as the Astral Sea, created with the immeasurable amount of power that was once held by the great human emperor. Great does not even begin to cover what I've just heard. Suping is startled by the prospect of such a thing and admits that it would likely fry his mind as well. One thing he knows for sure, though, is that the creature that has emerged from it now is every bit as vicious as it is evil. Bai is of the same opinion and admits that the transcendence god alone would be simple enough to take down. The problem, however, lies in the possibility, nay the probability, that the other four kings have freed themselves as well. The men around him are quick to remind Bai that the entrance of the abyss is guarded by a full four legendary beast tamers, who they would have heard from in such a case. However, that's not something that gives the old man any measure of comfort. Stu Ping is the first to realize why that is and asks the old man if he's implying that the legendary beast tamers who guard the abyss have already been defeated. While that conversation is underway, in another location, Ambi has finished transforming the entire mini army of humans that followed him into a bunch of mindless slaves of his own. He speaks of an interesting being who is able to probe his mind and directs this new army toward none other than Long Jian Base City, so that this person may be captured. Back with Su Ping and the others' conversation, VP Bai orders his men to recall all beast tamers in the wilderness at once. These tamers are then to be detained, and their identities verified, so they can weed out any non-humans masquerading as their kills. Additionally, they are to put more effort into exposing the energy crystal scam as well as seek assistance from the Pinnacle Tower organization to keep Abyss in check. When Su Ping asks what he can do, Bai tells him he's in charge of investigating the true reasoning behind the Transcendence God's actions. With his task assigned, Su Ping ends the holocall and proceeds to have a short argument with Anna over whether or not he can handle this on his own. After that, he calls Xu Kuang and his sister Su Ling Yue, since he last left them with a pioneering team in the wilderness. Much to Su Ping's shock, the two people he's calling actually show up to meet him in person just moments later. Seeing his surprise, they explain that they were told not to leave the city due to strange events in the wilderness recently. After the two sides are done, filling each other in on everything they've been up to since parting ways, Ling Yue tells her brother that his pet store played a huge role in preventing people from being tricked into going to the wilderness. In light of that, she asks him about expanding their business to neighboring cities, which are already beyond eager to have such a high-quality store available to their people. Seeing just how passionate she is about it and how well she seems to have done her research, Su Ping smiles at his sister and tells her he trusts her and handle the expansion side of their business herself. Afterward, Su Ping receives a call from Zhang, who informs him that she's made a breakthrough and is now capable of mass-producing the transformative serum used in the dragon blood vein forging technique. Not only that, the new serum formula can transform a bloodline by more than 50%, as opposed to the previous 0.1%. As he listens to the benefits of this breakthrough, Su Ping tells Zhang that he has a 9th tier beast in need of boosting, and informs her he'll be right there in a couple of minutes. Behind him, Su Ping is oblivious to the completely lost expressions of his sister and disciple, both of whom have no idea what that call is about. After waving goodbye to them, Su Ping kisses another 10,000 energy points goodbye and teleports to the store of his, where Zhang is working, barely even giving her time to process his arrival. Su Ping asks Zhang what her next project will be, so he can help gather the materials she'll need. As Zhang lays out the several possible options, one in particular stands out to Su Ping. The bond contract, which shares the strength enhancements of a beast with their tamer and vice versa. Su Ping's mind works overtime, as he considers the positive feedback loop that would be caused by using this contract in conjunction with the existing contract and seals placed on Umbrageddon's celestial dragon self. An eager grin finds its way onto Su Ping's face, as he turns to Zhang and confidently tells her to focus all her research efforts on this project. Inside a strange, somewhat rundown building, a group of beast tamers can be seen, 
being tested for any anomalies in their bodies. While three of the four men pass with flying colors, the same cannot be said for the fourth. The second the testing cuffs are put on his wrists, the man's body melts apart to reveal the demonic beast hiding under his skin. It only takes a few moments for everything to go straight to hell, as this demon kills everyone in its path. Left for last by the demon, one of the officials screams for someone to call headquarters, before being strangled half to death. Unfortunately for him, that's not where the torture ends. No. The demon attaches itself to the man. And in mere moments, every last bit of his essence is ripped from his being and siphoned into a glowing blue crystal. Left as little more than a breathing husk on death's door. The man rasps at the others in the building to run. Don't gotta tell me twice, chief. Get out of here. While most of the beast tamers in the building flee instantly, one in particular stays frozen in his spot, his eyes transfixed on the energy crystal that has fallen to the ground, created using the official's life. The man's friend screams at him to snap out of it and get the hell out of here, but his pleas fall on deaf ears. The fool simply falls to his knees, grabs the crystal, and desperately starts eating it, completely ignoring the horrified look on his friend's face. Even still, the other man tries to get his friend to rise and flee this place. Unfortunately, the man is too far gone, ripping his hand away and yelling that he doesn't care as long as he can get stronger. And just like that, he does get stronger. Blue veins run all across his body as his physique swells up to a much more impressive size. Drunk on his own newfound power, he doesn't realize it when his friend is crushed and left mangled against a wall by the demon. As said demon slowly siphons the injured man's life force into an energy crystal, the power-hungry fool asks if the demon is going to eat him too. This, of all things, draws a chuckle of amusement from the demon as it offers the crystal harvested from his friend to the man. No. If he can play his cards right, it plan to reward him greatly. Meanwhile, two men from VP Bai's group arrive at the Pinnacle Tower's base in the middle of a violent blizzard. Together, the two make the trek up to the summit, where their goal is, all the while speaking of their objective in coming here. Upon reaching the summit, they find themselves blocked from going further by an invisible barrier. Seeing no other way further, they begin calling out to the legendary drunken immortal sage, who they have come to speak to. They beg for him to let them meet the tower's master, so they can speak of the Transcendence Void's escape from the Abyss. Lying on a giant gourd, some ways away from the two men, a shattered figure sips from his glass, while paying them no mind. Someone get this man into Alcoholics Anonymous. Back in his base, VP Bai is informed that things are looking bleaker by the day. Not only have all three of the tasks he sent men out for failed, but a new evil organization has emerged as well, hunting humans to boost their own power. VP Bai himself lowers his eyes with anguish at the knowledge of how many base cities have fallen into chaos and disorder as infighting increases. Remembering the one person he believes won't fail him, Bai asks his men if they have any info on the progress of Su Ping's investigation. His men inform him that Su Ping has been spotted moving between multiple cities at a rapid pace as of late, making Bai believe that he's taking his investigation even more seriously than he thought. Right, it's he's considering giving Su Ping even more leeway for his efforts. The man who spoke before, pipes up to tell him they might be a tad mistaken. It seems that the movements he's making aren't for his investigation at all. He's just stocking up a whole bunch of new pet stores that he's been opening up in multiple base cities. Bai is all but frozen with incredulity. Upon hearing this, his face stuck in a deadpan expression. He's doing what a time like this? Hey man, the game's the game. True to the reports that have reached VP Bai's ears, Su Ping is currently hard at work, teleporting from base city to base city, resupplying his stores in each of them at a breakneck pace. While taking a short break in Rodent Lake Base City, he receives a call from Ling Yue and learns that they're short-staffed in several major base cities. When she asks if they should start hiring locally, Su Ping tells her to stick with her own personnel instead. That is to say, since dozens of their branches are run by members of the Qin, Zhou, Tang, Mu, Li Yu, and Yi families, they already have a crap ton of reliable personnel. In light of that, He's going to transfer command to her, so she can manage the stores and directly order the transfer of employees between bases. In the meantime, their main outlet in Longjiang will act as a training ground for staff. In the midst of explaining this strategy, Su Ping receives another call and answers it, only to be hit with the frustrated shrieks of VP Bai's men. As they yell at him and ask what the hell he thinks he's doing opening stores at a time like this, Su Ping just asks what's wrong with that. Okay, there's no way he's that oblivious right? One of Bai's men sends Su Ping data on the four major continents, where about half of the major base cities have fallen into disorder and chaos already, 
because of the Transcendence Void's influence. Hundreds of Tamers are being captured, and sucked dry daily, and perhaps worst of all, they're being led to the enemy by their own allies, humans turning on each other to please the demons and gain power through their means. As he ends his tirade, the man asks Su Ping again, if he thinks now is the time to be opening stores and raking in the cash. Unfazed by the man's attitude, Su Ping just asks him what the churn rate is looking like. In the back of the control room, old man Bai suddenly has an epiphany of sorts. Upon hearing Su Ping's choice of words, he tells the man to get the statistics for the number of pioneers in each base city, compared to the missing and were dead at once, and the results are more than a little eye-opening. Thirteen in the base cities and their records have remarkably low churn rates, twelve of them being right in the subcontinent. What's more notable, however, is that every one of these is a city where one of Su Ping's pet stores is currently operating. The man is stunned when he realizes that's precisely correct, and the stores are actually acting like havens for the tamers of each city. This only confuses him further though, as he wonders out loud how Su Ping is able to keep nearly a hundred stores running so efficiently. Enter Su Ling Yue, the prodigal sister with a knack for business. Su Ping brings her into the call, and introduces her as the manager of his stores, shocking all the agents that someone so young is so capable. Putting that aside, Su Ping lays out the strategy he's been cooking up as of late, since only about half of the base cities are in chaos, he wants to rescue the ones that are against the Transcendence Void's methods. From there, they'll shelter those people in the safe havens, created by his store's influence. From there, their combined forces will be formidable enough that the Transcendence Void's forces will only have two options, devour their own weaker members to stand against them, or surrender and be devour themselves. Either way, their forces will be severely weakened and thinned out this way. From there, it'll be easier than ever to retake their base cities and restore order. Old Man Bai admits the plan is a good one, but he doesn't believe expansion is viable at this point since they don't have the support of the Pinnacle Tower. That being the case, they won't be able to hold all 13 of their havens if the Transcendence Void's forces attack them all at once. Oh, on hearing this, Gao Peng is interested to hear about this Pinnacle Tower and what exactly it is. Bai explains that it's a group of 12 legendary tier beast tamers who can make or break any global conflict. Unlike the two or three legendary tier trainers per continent, who are affiliated with specific organizations though, those at the Pinnacle Tower answer to nothing other than their own whims, and shirk all responsibility. The siblings and Bai are in the middle of discussing, if these legendary tiers would really just let the world burn, when an alarm suddenly goes off. As one, it all turn to see what's wrong when an agent announces the issue. Several Beast Kings have been detected, along with a horde of high-level ferocious beasts gathering in a beast tide. And this beast tide is located outside, none other than Long Jiang base city in the subcontinent. That's right, Su Ping's home city is on the verge of a beast tide. A calamity that a base city all but never survives. Pish, those places didn't have Go Ping though. As they track the beast tide, Bai's men ask him if they should send reinforcements to the city beforehand. The old man relays this question to the Su siblings, and Ling Yue tells him of all the reasons why their city is perhaps the most well-equipped in its class to fight off something like a beast tide. Bai is quick to point out, however, that there are other factors they need to consider as well, such as the involvement of the Transcendence Void's forces in this matter. Deep in thought, Ling Yue asks how long they have till the beast tide reaches the city. One of the agents reports that they have about two days, which is how long it will take reinforcements to get there as well, so they must send them immediately. Before any such action can be taken though, Su Ping cuts in, and asks them to hear him out first. While our main man explains his plan to his allies, we see a sinister scene in the HQ of mainland base city, number 43. The officers there have been forced to send out an alert about a beast tide heading for Long Jiang, causing all the nearby base cities to deploy their troops towards Long Jiang, and leave their own cities defenseless. This is exactly what these men, the generals of the Transcendence Void's army, are counting on. One after the other, they tear down each of the base cities in the 40s while facing minimal resistance, thanks to their ruse with the Beast Tide warning. As the troop leaders of the Transcendence Void's army watch the cities that have fallen victim to them burned to cinders, they're more eager than ever and move to the next stage of their plan. Two days later, the Beast Tide reported to be heading to Long Jiang Base City has finally arrived. And among this tide is none other than the terrible Transcendence Void himself, or herself. I still can't tell to be honest. As the beast tide is spotted closing in on the city, all forces are deployed to stand at the ready for a battle. The generals report directly to Su Ping and await further orders while standing obediently. 
Su Ping's voice doesn't waver for so much as a millisecond, as he glares at the coming enemy, and orders his men to proceed as they planned previously. On the other side of the battlefield, Transcendence Void meets Su Ping's eyes and comments on the welcoming ceremony that's been put together for him. In response, Su Ping simply stares back with a steely gaze and tells the enemy that this is no welcoming party. It's his funeral procession. Now that's a threat. The end. For now.